May that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both. May we study together, work together with great vigor, and may this study be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. So we're continuing our study of the Katupanishad. There is a statement there which is very significant to us. When we start on a so-called spiritual journey or what we call religion, there is an expectation of a result somewhere. The reason why we engage in moral behavior normally is so that good can come from it. We are good in order to get good and we understand the consequence of cause and effect. Every system of moral behavior relies on this causal law. What Jesus calls sowing and reaping. It's a simple law it's a law that is also entrenched in modern physics, that every action has an equal or opposite reaction, and that you cannot add anything in a causal way or take anything away either. But as we go on, we'll see that whatever expectation we have is also accompanied by a negative. I want this. And I haven't got it. Everybody wants happiness on the basis that I haven't got it. I have moments of it, but it's not perpetual. I want to feel worthwhile. So what it is psychologically, I feel I am diminished in some way. So physically, psychologically, in every way, in every dimension of our life, we want to do better. People who are involved in a career, they want to do better. And so this ultimate goal of some kind of perfect ideal will have to be there. But at some stage or other, we'll have to see that this is not working properly for us. Then we have to ask some philosoph philosophical questions. Philosophical questions means nothing to do with the intellect. Philosophical questions, you see, if you take the root of it, etymologically, love of wisdom is another way of saying love of truth. What is the actual truth about something? Is it that the life is a perpetual movement of gaps and hollows that I have to make every effort to try to fill in, desperately doing it? Every time I turn a corner, there I see some deficit. So we start off from a position of deficit and theology in religion takes it over and says, we're born with a deficit. Some theologists do it. If it wasn't like that, there'd be no movement or motivation to strive for anything. And so that means that much of our moral behavior becomes actually self-centered. And egocentricity itself will have a fallout which is intrinsically against me. Because if I want to engage in an activity for my benefit, my benefit alone, then I would have to engage in maybe some immoral behavior. I don't want to cheat others so that I can get, get ahead. Or I won't wish others well. Sometimes in areas of competition, Nowadays, there are many, many competitions held for entertainment purposes. And so 
your competitor is essentially your enemy because they're preventing you from getting ahead. So Nachiketa in the Kottu Upanishad poses a very, very interesting question, very valid question. And he's asking, so he's asking him basically, Anyatra Dharmad, Anyatra Dharmad. Essentially he's saying, is there something that is different, something that is separate from what we call morality and immorality? Good and bad behavior, dharma and the dharma, and naturally their consequences. In other words, is there something different from a causal law and us being engaged in that? And uh, this cause and effect, just generally speaking, apart from moral behavior or otherwise, is there something different and separate from a natural moral, a natural causal law of sowing and reaping? Or even just if you look at nature as such, the temptation is to always find out what is the cause of something, what is the cause of something. The ancient philosophers had this understanding also. So if you want to find any strand of life, then the next question is, what causes it which is more subtle, more generalized? And so it goes on and goes on and goes on until, for example, in the Chandogya Upanishad, we come to a point where it is beyond light and there is a homogeneous presence called Agasha. This Agasha, which we can interpret as space or ether, some kind of substantial thing there, we want to introduce modern physics into it, we might say some kind of fluctuating quantum vacuum is there, but something higher is there. Sanat Kumar, in his dialogue in the Chandogya Upanishad, says something, yeah, something is higher than that, is prana, energy is higher than that. So far, we're all compatible with modern science. But what is energy? It is also a homogeneous thing, spread everywhere, you find it everywhere, and it gets expressed. But is there something that is different and separate from that, that is not a manifesting thing? That's a good question. It's a very key question because if I can find out that thing, if I can see that there's a sum totality, I will not assume that there is a gap and all my anxiety about filling it will also go. At some stage or other, I have to pose that question. Oh, you struggling person, is there a totality that remains unrecognized? where everything is all fulfilled. It is all full and free already. I don't have to necessarily struggle to gain something for myself or for others. The whole thing is already complete. Is there such a totality like that? And so, is there something that we can behold that is separate from Dharma and Dharma? In the Eight Upanishads, the translation goes like this. Tell me of that thing which you see as different from virtue and different from vice. Different from this cause and effect. Such a comprehensive question. And also different from time. Time relayed as past and future. Ayatra Dharmat different from virtue, is there something like that? Also a dharmat from vice, that is normal religious moral behavior, and different from akrata, the cause, and also anyatra bhutat cha, bhavyat cha, different from what was or will be in the future, different from that which is now, which is to become and which has also gone. And so with a view to speaking of the thing asked for, and also what attributes might be there, the great teacher in the Katupanishad, Yama, death himself, said to him who had inquired, 
the next stanza comes. He's going to tell briefly. It's a wonderful technique. Don't tell in great detail. Give an overview first. A brief. Then see if you can go it in, into it in detail. Give a helicopter understanding first. So he's saying, Yatpadam, uh, that attainable thing, that goal. So he's not, he's not saying there's no goal. There's a goal. You can underputs it very simply. Each soul is potentially divine, but the goal is to manifest that from within. In fact, the whole of our Vedanta missionary endeavor is exactly that. It's not to teach theology. It's not to teach mythology. It's not to teach ritual. Upanishads are based solidly on non-ritualistic truth. The Vedas being divided twofold. The ritualistic portion, which is mentioned here, this dharma, this adharma, this ritualism that will get me some result. Is there something that doesn't require a result because it's different from it? And therefore, it transcends any result like that. Is there something like that? And so, I tell you briefly of that goal, which all the Vedas, with one voice, all in agreement propound, which all the austerities speak of, any effort toward purification or strengthening of the will, what is called tapasya, wishing for which people practice. Practice uh, is something which goes against the normal trend of nature. Normal trend of nature is propagation of the species. And also streaming negative entropy on myself, eating, drinking, sleeping, in other words, living a struggling life where I maintain my existence, my physical existence. And by propagating the, spe the species, perpetuate myself through others, children, grandchildren, etc. So there is one goal, and it can be summarized in one word. And we covered some of this last week. So that word is a summary word because every word has a concept. And the concept might be extremely comprehensive depending on where you stand. It must be comprehensive. So what is this manifesting thing, this representative, this entity which is different and separate? It is this symbol of the very highest. It doesn't matter in three philosophical positions where you think that this highest principle is a personal God, or whether you think it is a connected thing, or whether you think it's an absolute. It's all covered by one word, one sound, and this sound is Om. Well, Swami Vivekananda in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras goes into great detail why this Om should be significant. And last week we may have summarized it. We can summarize it again. So this Om is what is called Shabda Brahman. That is the supreme principle in a sound form, in a vibration form. It can be heard by the yogis. In fact, many, many distinguished monks have asked, have you heard this Om? And a naive person may say, well, I, of course it's all in the scriptures and everybody repeating mantras says Om this and Om that. We began today's peace prayer like that. Om Sahanavatu, like that we began. And it is sacred in Sikhism, it is sacred in Jainism, it's sacred in Buddhism, it's sacred in Hinduism, and now has become a universal sound symbol also. But what is the significance of it? Swami Vivekananda gives a commentary, but this supreme principle with certain attributes, that is the attribute of an ancient teacher called Ishwara, and the practice of connecting with it is called, see, Tad Japaha, the repetition of this Om, and meditating on its meaning is the way. Very often people get confused about the practice of mantra. 
Why should we practice? Why should we repeat Om? Well, just rep repeating the sound is not enough because the sound will represent some concept, some deep concept is there. And I remember that uh, there was a, a musical group where many, many people attended. I hope it will be revived. So it's called Chant and Chai. Every week, uh, every first Saturday, I should say, of the month, they assembled in a hall and they gained great momentum, about 200 people and so on, and a great deal of chanting. And it was also uh, multi-denominational interfaith because also some Christian hymns were also being sung as well. Some Buddhist chanting also went on. But the vast majority was what is called kirtan, the repetition of certain sounds. For example, we are all familiar with uh, Hari, Ra, Hari Krishna Hari Ram. So repeating that, that's fine. Then if you ask participants where things are not properly explained, so what is the meaning of this? I don't care what is the meaning. It sounds good and I get a feeling of elevation when I hear all this. And the music is delightful. And the atmosphere is wonderful. Well, no doubt you get an elevated feeling from that. But if you really want to be precise and ask, but surely when you repeat a sound or repeat a word, there has to be a corresponding concept that goes with it. What is the concept that you have? And if you say, what is the reason why we feel elevated? It might boil down to a number of different things. That we are all doing this in unison. That the rhythm and the pace of it is elevating. That the accompanying music that goes with it, that the enthusiasm that everybody has, not necessary to understand it, surely. But then what we are saying is, yes, because if you want to go deeper into it, it's not just necessary to repeat, but also to meditate on its meaning. What does it symbolize? And so here in the Kattupanishad, we are told this entity, which is different from virtue, different from vice, different from causal laws, different from time, past and present and future, different from all of that, it is Om. And this Om can be used in many different ways. First of all, you can think of it as a symbol of a personal God. Secondly, you can think of it as an avenue, a word, something like a keyhole where you can access the Supreme. You can use it as a support or a means. Here it's called support, a means. Or you can feel that is indicating something that is transcendent. And this whole sound symbol is explained comprehensively in 12 short stanzas in the Mandukya Upanishad. And the Mandukya Upanishad is entirely dedicated to the subject because this single totality will express itself in at least three states of consciousness. And the A uh, is a primal sound. When we start making any kind of vocal noise, that's what we start off with, the first guttural sound. And then when you say, mm, there's a conclusion to it. And when the air passes, rolls over the tongue forward from the guttural to the labial, then you have the complete range of sounds. And when you have the complete range of sounds, you have the complete symbolism of everything that is manifested. In other words, everything that settles down on every vibration level. And eventually comes as a you and a me and a this and a that. That ultimately wants a differentiation and urges and an urge to behave in a moral way. So Swami Vivekananda's commentary on this is worth reading. We should there, we should, why should there be, he says, repetition. Why not say it once? We have 
not forgotten the theory of samskara. That means every word, every action, every thought settles down and echoes in the unconscious level of the mind and remains there with various associations. Modern psychology understands and knows this. The sum total of impressions lives in the mind. And from our point of view, not only the sum total of the impressions in this living body, but also what is called instinct. That is, all the impressions brought forward in the evolutionary process beyond the existence of this body and recorded as an individual experience. The wonderful idea of evolution. Things don't begin from the year dot when a baby starts crying. There's an accumulation of understanding and knowledge already in the child. And that goes back biologically way, 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 way back. So that even a single cell organism will learn how to survive, how to thrive in the depths of sulfurous volcanic conditions. It doesn't die. The most difficult thing in biological life, in the, the lifespan of a microorganism, is to destroy any microbe. You see it goes into a state of dormancy and revives. It's very difficult to kill microorganisms. They go into a dormancy, no doubt, but their reproductive rate is huge. Every 20 minutes, whole populations get renewed. So these samskaras are there. An internal memory that steers us toward our behavior because we put it there. They become more and more latent, but remain there. And as soon as they get the right stimulus, they come out. Stimulus comes from outside. Molecular vibration never ceases. When this universe is destroyed, all the massive vibrations disappear. What happens on the microcosm happens on the macrocosm. The sun, moon, stars, and earth, they melt down, but the vibration remains in the atoms. Each atom performs the same function as the big worlds do. So even when the vibrations of the mind stuff, which we call chitta, subside, its molecular vibrations go on. And when they get the impulse, they come out again. Now, he says, we can now understand what is meant by repetition. It is the greatest stimulus that can be given to the spiritual samskaras. One moment of company with the holy makes a ship cross the ocean of life. Such is the power of association. So this repetition of Om and thinking of its meaning is keeping good company in your own mind. Study and then meditate on what you have studied. Thus light will come to you. The self will come, become manifest. But one must think of Om and its meaning too. Same with any mantra. You, if you interpret mantra to be a protecting thought arising from the Sanskrit manasa, mind, it protects you because it fills the mind. It gives you holy company. It now has the capacity to settle as a samskara and neutralize anything which is negative there. Avoid evil company, he says, because the scars of all wounds are in you. And the evil company is just the thing that is necessary to call them out. And we have a primary thing which we call in psychology an original wound, something that determines our personality. In the same way, we are told that good company will call out the good impressions that are in us, but which have become latent. There is nothing holier in the world than to keep good company, because the good impressions will then tend to come to the surface. So he's saying, from that is gained the knowledge of introspection and the destruction of obstacles, as Patanjali and Swami Vivekananda goes on. The first manifestation of the repetition and thinking of Om is that the introspective power will manifest more and more. All the mental and physical obstacles will begin to vanish. So it is much more than just a symbol. Much, much more. 
is a practical application to it also. So the goal which all the Vedas uh, proclaim, which all penance declare and desiring which they lead the life of this self-control of brahmacharya, I can tell you in brief, it is this one thing, Om. Now the word goal is here, but the original, of course, will be, can, can be interpreted as a state or a word, but it has the same intrinsic meaning. Of course, Shankaracharya in his commentary, he takes it to mean the goal. Because in other passages, we are told that it is something to be aimed for. It is the goal. But it can be also interpreted as word, and it really doesn't have any intrinsic difference because the word and the concept are exactly the same. It is Om, which is called Shabda Brahman, and that is the phonetic symbol of Brahma, Brahman. It's the, in it is, we find the rudimentary sounds as there can be no idea or thought without corresponding name or word or sound. Sound is considered as inseparably associated with the ideation. So that we have to understand. Then this syllable is Brahman. What we mean by Brahman in this case though, what this Upanishad means by Brahman is what is called Saguna Brahman. So we have to explain. Are there two Brahmans? Is there Nirguna and Saguna? No. When, when Nirguna Brahman, Nirguna, that is without any expression, without any manifestation, without any variation, when it stands alone, it is in its pristine element. It is pure being. But when we add time and space and movement and causal relationships and so on, then it manifests, it's a manifesting thing. And that manifesting thing we call Sadguna Brahman, that is with qualities. So it goes on like that. This letter Om is indeed the inferior Brahman, that is the Sadguna Brahman, and that we can call Hiranyagarbha. So therefore Om and Hiranyagarbha. What is Hiranyagarbha? Literally a golden womb. That is a creative potential from which everything else is going to come. And when that starts vibrating, we have the first birth of what is called Vak, word itself. And then Vak, Vak Devi in the feminine form, comes out in modern Hinduism as Saraswati. Saraswati, the Shakti, or the power, or the energy of this creative potential called Brahma, is the womb of all beings. We can think of the physiology of the whole cosmos in this way. And this letter is also the Supreme Brahman, Nirguna Brahman. Anybody who, while meditating on this letter, wants any of the two, then to him it comes. If we want that absolute entity, it'll come to him. But if we want a vision of God, if we want God, that also will come to him because this Om covers everything. The A, says the Mandukya Upanishad, covers the waking state. Represents the Hiranyagarbha or the causal, the subtle state. And the causal state is the final M, but then followed by a silence. And that silence is unmanifested. That pause represents this Nirguna. So this question is being answered slowly by stating something in brief. Then it goes on like this. This Om is the best support. That is, a, it is the best means. It is the best help. It is the best medium through which we can attain the highest. This medium is the Supreme, and this medium is also 
the lesser one or the saguna or the manifesting aspect of it, meditating on this medium, one becomes adorable in the world of Brahman. In other words, this grossness, this nearness becomes oneness an identification takes place through this means. And then you cannot hide your light under a bushel or bed. It becomes obvious to all about an enlightened condition, so-called. So the idea is this, getting identified with the Supreme Brahman or even with God as a result of meditation, that person becomes adored like Brahman. That is why we honor saints and rishis and sages and so on, because we can see that reflected glory. So for those aspirants of medium and inferior quality, Om has been indicated both as a medium for meditation, Sisi commentary, and also a symbol for worship. And worship of what? Ultimately worship of the self, that is the intrinsic entity within you which is also devoid of all attributes and which was inquired about in this original question. Tell me of that thing which you see as different from virtue, the question we began with. Now this verse is said with a view to ascertain directly the nature of that self, which has the Om as its medium, is the introduction to the next verse. So it goes on like that. Vipashit, the intelligent one. Is neither born nor does it die. Now we find echoes of another text, the Bhagavad Gita. Almost word for word. Certainly the ideas are the same. So let us see. If you think that all your activity will sustain you in some way in this world and that ritualistic activity will give you some kind of heaven, then you have not gone deep enough. You haven't gone to the essence. You haven't answered and asked this question. So a common question to everybody that people have is, so when I die, where do I go? It's a meaningless question in the light of what is about to come. All this birth, life and death is all time bound, it is also all causally connected. Anybody who goes through this journey of life will know that as years go by, the body changes, old age kicks in, and then the destiny, the end of your station comes, where's this train going? Have to get off at a platform somewhere and then what happens is there something that takes me on from there or is my journey complete or does it continue with another train in this kind of symbolic language we ask this question about birth life and death but this fundamental consciousness this entity that reflects itself in this very question that reflects, uh, uh, reflects itself in our own so-called intelligence. This is not born and it doesn't die. The question doesn't arise. Never born and it never dies. It doesn't originate or spring from anything. Everything we ask, has, uh, we ask from a point of view, it has a starting point somewhere. But that becomes a big mistake. Swami Vivekananda makes a very, very interesting commentary in his series of Vedanta to do with practical Vedanta. He tells us this, worth quoting. He says, This earth is transient because it has name and form. And so the heavens must be transient also because there also name and form remain. A heaven which is eternal will be contradictory in terms, because everything that has name and form must begin in time. That's why this question arises. 
It must begin in time, it must exist in time, it must end in time. These are settled doctrines of the Vedanta, and as such, the heavens are given up. Don't forget, the earlier part of religious practices, and Nachiketa's only own request, is there some fire ceremony that will give me immortality? That is, that will give me a relative uh, immortal existence. It seemed to go on forever in a better condition than, than this earth where I spend my pocket money. And we have seen, says Swami Vivekananda, in the Samhita portion, that the idea of heaven was that it was eternal, much the same as is prevalent among Muslims and Christians. The Muslims concretize it a little more. They say it is a place where there are gardens beneath which rivers run. In the desert of Arabia, of course, water is very desirable. And so the Muslims, they always conceive of heaven as coming, as containing water, springs, and so on. But for the English people, of course, I'm extracting a little bit here. For the English people, where they have tons of rain, or here on the island where they have tons of rain, maybe heaven is not like that, or should not be like that. They want a hotter climate. They want something like a Spanish heaven. So these heavens in the Samhita are eternal, and the departed have beautiful bodies and live with their forefathers, and are happy ever afterwards. There they meet with their parents, children, and other relatives, and so on. Now, all the difficulties and obstructions to happiness in this life have vanished, and only its good parts and enjoyments remain. But however comfortable mankind may consider this state of things, truth is one, and comfort is another. And there are cases where truth is not comfortable until we reach its climax. Human nature is very conservative. It doesn't. It does something, and having once done that, finds it hard to get out of it. But he points out, in the Upanishads that we are studying, we see a tremendous departure made. It's declared that these heavens in which men live with the ancestors after death cannot be permanent, seeing that everything which has name and form must die. So we are thinking of something different. We're not asking this question. So there are three significant things given. Firstly, there's no beginning, there's no origin. There's no creator starting off from the start or a beginning of creation. We may as well say also there's no create creation event. There's no Big Bang. It is birthless. It doesn't have an origin like that. That's to do with name and form. It is eternal, that is, it has no uh, time limitation and it is undecaying. In other words, it has no parts because things which have parts in space will decay. No time, no space, no beginning, no end. The no end comes in the expression that it is ancient. Purisham, it is ancient so ancient that you cannot trace when did it start it is not injured when the body is killed now why would we bring the idea of killing into the Katu Upanishad because killing is an activity now we can see so many comparative passages in the Bhagavad Gita which gives a practical dimension to what is being told If the killer thinks of it in terms of killing, and if the killed thinks of it as killed, both of them don't know. It does not kill, nor is it killed. How does one know the self, says the commentator? This is being said. So the self, any young sattla, sattla then an atom, 
that is subtler than the most the smallest possible component in physical life in materiality we can imagine the smallest smallest tiniest component but the science has a great experiment going to find out what else is even more subtle than the most subtle thing that we knew of maybe 100 years ago namely an atom is there something smaller than that yes something is smaller than this anyan subtler this anaha that the subtle the, and you can see the same root by the way see uh, uh, at atom atomic subtler than that yes subtler than the grain and yet greater than our greatest and grandest vision of existence in the universe this is all said before the discoveries of modern science imagine expand your imagination to its greatest tense it's greater than that much greater imagine something so subtle that you can't even trace it you can't even see it you can't touch it you can't taste it you can see where it left a trace behind this is the world of modern physics and so greater than that the great is lodged in the heart of every creature now theologically some people are asked does an animal have a soul the human has a soul does an animal have a soul this goes to the heart of matter and says in the very heart that is the very foundation of every being this self is the same self that exists not an individual self is not a soul with a body nothing like that and a desireless man sees that the glory of the self through the serenity of the organs and therefore he becomes free from sorrow don't forget what is our original goal let us be free from sorrow so the Bhagavad Gita tells us this it says if you don't want to grieve then what if you don't want pain and sorrow and difficulties what will you do let us just review the comparative passage in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita in the Bhagavad Gita Arjun who represents all suffering humanity in a, some kind of mental turmoil some kind of dichotomy being faced a paradox in life to do with pleasure and pain and sorrow grief the greatest fear of all is the fear of death and yet if there's something that is unborn that doesn't have any subjectivity to time or space has no origin has no death then the question does arise what is the trap we're caught in this sense of time and space and origin and all these things that we assume are ourselves what is in short called embodiment sense of embodiment and in the case of arjun that is the case of us all anybody who wants to practically insert some kind of comfort toward the potentially grieved or those who are bereaved they must install some self-confidence and this self-confidence will come from this idea of your own immortal self conclude the rest of these passages next week Om Shanti 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 Peace 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 Be unto all Om.